Uh, so if everyone could mute themselves uh, until it's time for public comment. Um, welcome to the April 11th Legislative Matters meeting. I'm Alex Jarrett and I'll be chairing uh, this afternoon. Um, Pam, could you call the roll, please? Absolutely. Councillor Jarrett. Here. Councillor Elkins. Here. Councillor Moulton. Here. Councillor Nash. Here. Have a quorum. Uh, this meeting will be audio and video recorded. Uh, and our first item on the agenda is public comment for items that uh, are not on the agenda. So if you're here for the public hearing for the package of the 14 zone, zoning amendments for the form-based code, um, please hold your comments until that hearing, which will be right after this. If you wish to comment on something that's not on the agenda, uh, please raise your hand uh, either in your screen or using the uh, raise hand feature. And let me know if you're having any trouble with that. And I'm not seeing any hands. Oh, Claudia Lefko. Sorry, we just have a question if we're here to comment on the uh, zoning as it applies to 107. Should oh, we I hold lost off Claudia. till? Did you start over? Sorry. I said if we're just here to comment on you know the situation at 107 as vis-a-vis -vis how it relates to the zoning. Do you want us to talk now or you want us to hold our comments? I mean, it's all about zoning. Okay. I just don't know when to is appropriate. Right. I would say since that is not in the area of what we'll be we'll be considering tonight, there's no proposed change for that area. Mm -hmm. That you should comment now. <clears throat> okay. Very good. Then I'll raise. I'll keep my hand up. So. Okay. So great. I, and um, if you could uh, keep your comments <laughs> to three minutes, that would be appreciated. And Claudia, you have the floor. Okay, sorry, I'm first going to read a statement from Deidre Muccio. Um, she's, uh, she lives in the lumber yard, so she'll, I'll have two things to say. Um, I, I can't see the clock, I've got it on email, sorry, so I'll try to just let me know when I'm coming to the end. All right, am I ready sure. to go? Yeah. Hello, my name is Deidre Muccio, and I live at the lumber yard in Northampton. I moved into the lumber yard, which was nearly completed in July of 2019. I was one of the lucky ones who won the lottery, yet living downtown has proven not the healthiest place for me to be for a number of reasons, and none of them having to do with my fellow tenants or even the building's location on Pleasant Street. Make no mistake, many are thrilled to be here living downtown in a truly affordable apartment. But for me, I need green space around me in order to thrive. I walk the back streets of Ward 3 and rejoice that there's a decent semblance of fresh air still available there. I've made many friends who live in Ward 3 and considers those streets, Hawley, Williams, Montview, Henry Valley, and others, part of my home. In regard to zoning changes, old and new, how will a development such as one or seven Williams where eight half unit condos for sale are slotted to go up, how will that impact air quality on those streets? Will my friends and I suddenly find ourselves enveloped in a cloud of laundry fumes and fumes from idling cars warming up in the winter? What protections are in place to capture particulates and other toxic substances during the period the building is being torn down? I note that city inspectors signed off on the lumberyard acceptability before anyone moved in, and tenants now know that the air quality inside the building, as well as around the building, is atrocious. This was touted as being constructed with all state-of-the-art technology, and yet those of us who live here and care about air quality, some of us with serious health conditions doubly irritated by these exposures, suffer a constant bombardment from sources of a whole host of contaminants. In the first year of living here, and who knows what else set my carbon monoxide meters off more than once, and there was no fire in my apartment or elsewhere in the building. If what passes as an acceptable standard for air emissions is as lousy as it has proved to be with the erection of a four-story building on Pleasant Street, what will be the impact of eight new units pumping out whatever they will be pumping out on a house on, a house on those little back streets that provide some of us a welcome refuge from the noise and grime of town? 
On, on a similar note, the sound of wood choppers while walking up on the dike is painful to my ears, not because they're defini definitely loud, but because it spells the destruction of mature living trees, trees that do a better job of cooling streets. Are you, is that three minutes? No, I'll keep going. Just let me know, Alex, because I can't see the clock. Um, um, what, for example, will go up at 107 will not be, will be none of that. <clears throat> How is it that- Oh, condoms... Claudia, you missed a line. <laughs> oh, sorry. Hi, hi there, Deirdre. Let me go back. Sorry, stop the clock. On a similar <laughs> note, the sound of wood chippers while walking up on the dike is painful to my ears, not because they're deafeningly loud, but because it spells the destruction of mature living trees, trees that do a better job of cooling streets and roots that do a better job of absorbing water, carbon dioxide, and other harmful gases, such as sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, and they release oxygen. And what, for example, will go up at 107 Williams will do none of that. How is it that the condos- Claudia, that if you can, um, fit, that was three minutes, if you could finish your sentence. Oh, okay, oh. Um, I'll just read to the end of this sentence, okay? Um, how will, um, sorry, how, how is it that the condos that already have been built downtown at the other end of Ward 3 still stand unoccupied, that housing is in great demand, and yet it, it, I'm just finishing the sentence, and yet it remains unaffordable for your average wage earner and the offspring of current residents and existing homeowners. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. And now you'll <laughs> be speaking for yourself? Yes, and now I'll be speaking for myself and I'll disappear again. Hang on. So, um, Claudia Lefko, 40 Valley Street. Um, I want to speak um, to this from a social justice perspective. Our Montview neighborhood, indeed Ward 3B, falls into a low middle income bracket. I haven't checked very recently, but it's been true historically. We were eligible for CDBG funding for the original playground at Bridge Street School in the early 90s. And then as a board member of the Center for the Arts, I know certain grants were available to support the 33 Holly Street Arts Trust because we're a low income neighborhood. So it's our lower income neighborhood now that's the prime target for infill, a neighborhood whose residents are less able or cannot afford to hire a lawyer to protect ourselves from overfill development. Residents in other neighborhoods with deep pockets have hired lawyers and that has helped them overcome unwanted development. We've suffered in a number of ways. One, we can't afford legal advice. And two, the city planning office seems to feel most responsible to the developers rather than to the residents, meeting with them to ensure their projects fit all legal requirements. And when they failed in one aspect, that was notifying abutters on the proposed project. And we appealed based on that technicality our appeal was sent to the wrong office, and I assume they were rejected because we're not lawyers. We're not capable of dealing with this sort of thing. And lastly, in terms of suffering, we're one of the oldest neighborhoods without adequate, and in some cases without any infrastructure to support more and more infill. We're tight, we've try tried, and residents in Bay State have tried to cite factual on the ground reasons and reasons based on the city's own contradictory standards to oppose the infill projects, but facts don't seem to move the decision-making powers. I'm hoping this committee will, however, finally recognize the many real problems that exist under current and in proposed zoning changes, and that those problems, along with the question I've raised of social justice, which residents and which neighborhoods are poised to suffer the most with these policies will cause you to take pause and vote no on any new exist on any new zoning proposals until the current problems and issues are resolved. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia, and thank you, Deirdre. Uh, Vicky Van Z, you're here to speak to the. Uh, remember, this is public comment for items not on the agenda, not about the public hearing that's coming up. Don't we get the hand back? Yeah. Vicky, can you? Um, I just yeah. Great. Yeah, I'm 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 going to yield my time to Bill though, because we can't figure out how to raise his hand. <laughs> so I raise my hand for Bill. Okay. Is that okay? 
Yes. My name's Bill Yule. I live at 57 Henry. Um, like many people here, I was upset to see how jammed 107 William Street is, and it seemed out of proportion to me, almost unreasonable to me. So I was thinking, is this what was intended really by first the planning group and then the city council? They really want this level of, of new enhanced density? So my wife and I and my daughter Kate did a little survey of just the buildings on Henry Street. There's 14 buildings that contain 28 units. As of right, with the new URC run, zoning, they would be allowed to produce 88 units or 60 more than are there now. What seems reasonable to me is in an area like ours to double the amount of housing we have. This is quadrupling the amount of housing we have. It seems out of proportion. Um, I can't believe this is what was expected or anticipated or desired by your group. It just seems stunning to me. Um, so I'd like an answer to that. And I would love Jim to put together a list of possible units by right and with special permit on all the lots in the, the zoning area, the, the URC zoning area. And just as a further question, I would love to know if the second test bit was done at 107 Williams and what the results were, because that's an area that is known to have to hold water for long periods of time. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Ward Morehouse, who is not actually Ward Morehouse, would you uh, state your name? It's my late husband's name and it's in this computer and usually I can rename. But when I'm dealing with the city, only the chair can rename. I remember when Gina Louise was chairing, she said she would change it. Anyway, I'm Carolyn Oppenheim, but Ward Morehouse's ideas would be better. I wish you were here with us. Um, so <clears throat> a couple of things. In this process, I'm learning about a lot about the city and how it works through this particular case study of 107 Williams. And what I want to address is much broader than 107 Williams. Um, so we have learned that the property owner, there's a phrase as by right. And my reaction is by what authority? By what authority does the city grant this property owner a right, but I, who pay close to $6,000 a year for my property to live here, don't have equal rights to weigh in. And this property owner, by his own admission, when he met with us, and he was a nice guy and he tried to mediate with us, he said that in the process of preparing his plan, he got all kinds of support and advice from planning people and DPW in this city. But when we, the residents, want to register an appeal, which is not saying we're, it's against it, we wanna open up space to debate it and discuss it, we're treated in a very rude way as if we have no rights. We're, they play a game of gotcha. We sent an appeal letter and we're told, ha ha, I mean, really, with that kind of dismissive tone, you didn't send it to the right place and now it's too late. And this happened not just to one group of us who did it, but to another neighbor of mine who um, had some very good arguments to make. And one of those arguments had to do with stormwater. And I just discovered something that I wish our city had I'm gonna read it briefly. New York City has an urban forestry registry in which they actually have counted and identified all their trees. And I'm looking for the correct wording while I still have time. Basically, they can evaluate how much stormwater the tree sucks up, how much electricity it saves, how much of this it saves. In, in other words, they quantify it as part of the engineering, not, not just aesthetics and oh, isn't this beautiful, but, but the sort of engineering value of keeping that tree. And that is something that we don't do in this city. 
to my knowledge, and would be a very good talking point. So what I've concluded from my sad journey here in this very adversarial experience, and it's going to be project and makes no sense. I think that the city should pause infill and should do an evaluation of what has happened since it was passed. Was it five, seven years ago, something like that? Um, and look at all the fights, look at all the objections and evaluate the pros and cons of whether it has achieved what it set out to achieve. Neighbors were persuaded to support Carolyn, it. Uh, that was time, so if you could finish your sentence. Okay. Neighbors were persuaded to support infill based on a list of aspirational sustainability values, and I would like us in our forum to look at that and see whether, in fact, what we've done matches up with what we were offered and told it would be. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, I also realize I need to ask her if folks city or town. Uh, oh, I live at Three Montview Avenue, Northampton. Great, thank you. Um, so Claudia has it, but I assume, is this Mac who is wishing to speak? Yes, it's Mac sharing Claudia's okay. computer. Could you, uh, yeah, your name and city or town and- Okay, Mac Everett, and I live at 40 Valley Street uh, in Northampton in the Montview neighborhood. So shall I start? Yes, please. Okay. Um, first, I wanna thank members of this committee for extending the public comment period for this hearing. I really appreciate your willingness to give your time to allow this airing of opinions. Our sustainability plan and zoning calls for densification of downtown neighborhoods. This got me wondering, how many housing units do we currently have in Northampton? And how many of those built, uh, units were built in the last 10 years, ward by ward? And looking to the future, how many new units do we think we need to build in the coming decade? Beyond the general goal of densification, what exactly are we aiming for? Is there a percentage increase or a number we're aspiring to meet? And how many of those will be affordable? Filling in these blanks with some metrics, I think will help citizens understand the process and the goals of infill policy better. Right now, most of us or mo uh, maybe all of us commenting tonight represent the latest, but probably not the last side street conflict between preserving the character of a neighborhood through a more moderate approach, such as adding a unit or two, and an extreme approach that maximizes development. That approach blatantly ignores concerns about too much loss of green space, affordable homes, and historic buildings. It enables replacing them with oversized structures that bear little or no resemblance to the community around them. I'm also asking you to advise your fellow council members to vote in favor of a moratorium on new zoning proposals while you review the impacts of current infill law, identify its strengths and correct its weaknesses. This absolutely would be in keeping with the objectives of our sustainability plan. It explicitly addresses the need for genuine community input into decision-making, respect for the character and history of neighborhoods and the need for infrastructure upgrades on side street projects. I also wanna thank those of you who took the time to come and see for yourselves the current conditions on William Street where those eight condos are permitted by right to replace one small house. Despite this massive increase, the developers and the city are given a pass to upgrade the heavily trafficked narrow street, the cramped sidewalks and the aged stormwater system. If we're going to allow this scale of densification on side and back streets without updating infrastructure, aren't we just asking for a lot more trouble? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mac. Uh, next is Lynn. 
Hi, uh, I also want to thank you all for giving us an opportunity to speak. Lynn, could you state your name and city or town? Sure, my name is Lynn Yanis. I'm in Northampton on 30 Valley Street. And so I am another one of the more than three dozen people who are very um, heavily affected by the planned development at 107 Williams. And um, I'm sorry to say I wrote up a whole thing and then my computer just went dark. So I'm gonna have to speak a little bit off the cuff here to say that I also want to direct the legislative committee or subcommittee uh, to direct your attention to the goals of Sustainable Northampton, which talks repeatedly about operating the city as a democratic enterprise and encouraging and giving voice to neighborhood organizations and developing a process for negotiations with neighborhoods about projects that are going to affect their communities. It's right there in Sustainable Northampton. And what has happened for us is that there's a whole bunch of us who by law, Mass General Law, Chapter 40, Section 11, are defined as parties of interest. Uh, again, don't have it right in front of me, unfortunately, but, um, you know, a butters, a butters of a butters, and people whose property lines are within 300 feet of the property line of the affected property. That is the definition of the parties of interest. Three dozen of us got no notification ahead of the approval of these plans at 107. A couple of people received some flyers stuffed in their mailbox. The rest of us, nothing, until we got a postcard. We got a postcard that was postmarked a week after the planning commission, the planning board approved the site plan. And that postcard said, you have thus amount of time to appeal. We did submit an appeal and the appeal got kicked back as one of my neighbors mentioned saying, mm, you sent it to the wrong address. Well, I have the postcard in front of me. There was no other address on the postcard other than the planning department. And so we sent it to the planning department. So it really feels like, I don't know, is it a bait and switch or a catch 22? We were not given an opportunity to know ahead of time. We were theoretically given an opportunity to appeal. We appealed but we were not really given an opportunity to appeal. And if we return to these goals of sustainable Northampton, democratic process, encouraging neighborhood organizations and establishing a process for negotiations with the neighborhoods, I just have to point out that there have been the, all of this upheaval here at 107 Williams, at 30 Williams, on Warfield Place, throughout Bay State have there been so many development projects over this last year or two. And I think we can anticipate a whole lot more if these proposed adjustments or uh, this proposed zoning plan goes into effect, as I believe you're going to be discussing later in the meeting in Florence, because there seems to when be that no... was time. If you could just okay. finish your sentence. Thank you very much. The reason being, there appears to be no explicit, transparent opportunity for negotiations. So we see neighborhoods like Fort Hill, Olive Street, where there are planned developments that then don't happen. And we see other developments that do happen and we have to wonder why, where's the process for democratic decision-making? Thank you very much. Thank you, Lynn. All right, seeing no other hands, let's move next to uh, the continuation of the public hearing on our proposed zoning changes. And um, this is a package of 14 amendments, zoning amendments to implement the form-based code for downtown Northampton and Florence Center. And we opened the hearing on March 24th, 2022 um, the, we received a positive recommendation from the planning board then, and um, the, the hearing has now been continued to today. So that hearing is open. And um, let's see. 
So I wanted to explain the public hearing process uh, a little bit before we begin. Um, so for us counselors who are on this committee, we don't deliberate about this issue until the public hearing is closed. Um, and then once it is closed, only members on the committee will be deliberating. So for members of the public, which includes if there are any counselors who are not on this committee, the hearing is your time to ask questions uh, and to give your comment. Um, and counselors who are on the committee may ask questions uh, during the public hearing, but we should re refrain from deliberating. Um, and so um, I would propose that Carolyn, if um, you would like to add anything, I, I would like to ask actually, if you could walk us through the proposed changes that the planning board approved, um, just so we have an understanding uh, of the recommendations that they made um, uh, before we move, move on to the wider public hearing. Sure, um, thanks and good evening. I uh, sent to the counselors the proposed changes that came out of the planning board um, conversation two weeks ago. Um, so if you, I'm just going, I don't know if you want me to screen share those or not. There are about four different pages, I believe, that were where changes were made. Um, yes, please do, Carolyn. Have, yeah, have the raw great. one up. Okay. I, so did let me you, just, I did make you a co-host, so you should be all set with that. Okay, thanks, Pam. Um, this will just take me two seconds here. Let me just find the right version. Okay, um, can you see the screen here? I think this is page one. Um, it's actually page 18. Um, there was a conversation with the planning board that's sort of, I'm gonna go through the order of the changes from the beginning of the document. And this is only relates to, so as part of this package, just to remind everyone, there are 14 proposed zoning amendments. 12 to 13 of them are about cleaning up so that you can interweave this new section into the zoning code. So the changes I'm going to talk about now are just in the bulk of the document that is the form-based code. So it's a hundred page document. This is the first um, page of changes, which is page 18 of that document, which talks about roof styles. And um, the planning board voted to um, modify this um, item on page 18, where it said, it describes that mansard and gambrel roofs are not, um, not allowed. Um, they recommend that mansard roofs be allowed, but that they would only be allowed on taller buildings. So buildings with three stories or more, because um, when they're smaller, that's where the, um, the ratio of roof to building um, is really um, very, presents very differently on the street than for taller buildings. So that's the first change on page 18. And Carolyn, then, could you describe yep. what a mansard and a gamble roof are? Sure. So um, a mansard roof is one where you, it's sort of a squared off um, facade of the roof. So it's flat on the top and comes down the side. So Sylvester's restaurant is a good example of an historic building with a mansard roof. Um, and then similarly, gambrel roofs also have sort of the side of the roof folding down um, the building as opposed to having a gabled end roof, which is just a, a, like a triangle shape at the top or a flat roof um, where you'd have a parapet wall. 
the next change is on page 72. And this is just a, an editing issue whereby we had a lot of discussion about um, allowing ground floor residential uses in the central business district, side street and gateway, which is not currently allowed now. And um, there was a leftover reference to a site plan approval for ground floor use limitation, which is ground floor use limitation means there's a limit on the types of uses allowed on that first floor. And it was not intended to remain with a site plan here. It was really intended to be zero feet. So there's no limit throughout the entire first floor of the building for the side street district. The same edit I think is, um, is on several of the other subsections where this is in the leftover um, notation. So um, we go down to, um, I guess it'll come up in the next few pages. The next change is on page 88, um, where, and this applies to Florence Village Center District, which um, in Florence Center, the proposal is to take um, two commercial districts and, and rename them and create um, two sort of uh, downtown or village center districts. One would be Florence Village Center and the other is Florence Village General. The center area is the node or the intersection of Maple and Main. And then the other area is Chestnut Street and Main Street or the Florence Village Center. And then a few parcels around that. Uh, this was a recommendation to allow planning board review to um, for uh, situations in which uh, buildings behind the buildings that are on the street could be, uh, the minimum heights could be less than 20 feet. So right now what's presented is a 20 foot height minimum in the Florence um, Center. And this would say, well, if there are situations where your building is set behind another building, for example, a parking garage or some accessory structure, uh, the board, there may be circumstances where it makes sense to have something that's not quite 20 feet tall as the minimum. And so that was recommended by the planning board for both Florence Village Center and then also um, Florence Village General District. So the next page I'm just flipping through is again that reference to site plan. Take that out for Florence Village General on page 94. And then the next page um, also is about the minimum height allowance in Florence Village General, and that's on page 95. And that's the extent of it. Those are the changes. Great, thank you. And do we, uh, just a process question, do we have to approve those changes or rather do they become part of it unless we uh, vote for them not to be? Um, they, um, you can vote any way you like, if you don't vote, it, so you can vote keeping the ordinance the same, it's a separate vote. So you would be either voting to keep the ordinance as introduced, um, or introduced also, um, with the planning board recommended changes. That way it's the same recommendation that's going to full city council. I mean, if you didn't want to do that, then it just goes to council floor and the council decides, you know, which version makes sense. Great, thank you. And a point of council. order. Jim, yes. So um, these changes, we want to discuss them out. It's great they're, they've been presented, they can be part of the public hearing, but us deliberating and voting on them would be out once we close the pub public hearing, correct? Correct. Okay. So people can have at it right now on those changes. Right. Carolyn, did you, have, did you have anything else to add um, before we, I'll, I'll, I'll next take questions from counselors and then uh, open the floor to the public. Um, no, I didn't have anything else to add. Okay. Any questions from counselors? Okay. Um, then we will start the public uh, hearing process for 
open to the public. And um, again, um, so please try to keep your initial comments to three minutes or less, and then we will circle back if there's time. Um, I imagine there will be. Uh, and if you could state your name and address uh, and, and city or town. Uh, so Claudia Lefko. Hi, just a quick question, Claudia Lefko, 40 Valley Street. Is it possible that out of this subcommittee will come even another recommendation, which is what the public has kind of been leading you towards, which is to say, we want to put them, we can't decide on this package, we can't decide on, on it because there are too many unresolved issues. Is that another, another decision that could come out of this subcommittee? Um, I, I, so I would normally take questions for a while and then answer them, but that's Fine. basically a process yeah, yeah. note that I feel like I can answer now, uh, which is, yeah, uh, well, we are tasked with making a recommendation on this particular issue. Um, we can vote a positive, a neutral, or a negative recommendation, and we can make proposed amendments. Uh, and the, and in, we can provide comment in those, uh, in, in our recommendations that then the council can take up. Thank you, thanks. Yep. Other members of the public. Yeah. I'm not seeing any more hands. Um, I, so I just wanna, Make sure that I'm not missing anyone. Do we have other questions from counselors before we would, um, and the next step, if we don't, I don't have anything more from the public or questions from counselors would be to close the public hearing. Okay, um, then I would entertain a motion to close the public hearing. I would move, uh, so move. Second. Any discussion on closing the hearing? Roll call, please. Councillor Jarrett? Yes. Councillor Elkins? Yes. Councillor Moulton? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Okay, the public hearing has been closed. Um, so I would entertain a motion for a recommendation uh, on these ordinances and then uh, we can begin our deliberation. Uh, I would move that we recommend these uh, ordin ordinances uh, in total. Uh, with a positive recommendation? With a positive recommendation, yes. Okay. I'll second that. Are you including the um, uh, the amendments by the, or the changes by the uh, planning board? Oh, yes, I should have said that. I, I as, as amended by the planning board. Second. Okay, the motion uh, is on the floor. And uh, discussion. Jim. Well, I, I actually have a, a a number of questions I'd, I'd like to um, put out here. Let's see if I can pull up. Okay. Um, it, so, um, Councillor Jarrett, do we do we want to go? Or do we just want to talk about all of these as a group, or do we want to go through them one by one? Or um, I. The current motion is to talk about them as a group. Um, oh, and we certainly can take them uh, piece by piece, you know, bring up whatever issue you like. And then, you know, we have the option to um, take particular ones out and have recommendations that are different for, for different items if we wish. But as of now, um, we are free to, to talk about any of them uh, to the motion. Okay. So, um, all right, that, that works fine. I, I, I'll just, my questions kind of relate to the order of the, um, 
of the different proposed items. And, um, but anyway, I, so I, I'm just, I'll, I'll start asking them here. Um, so, uh, uh, so Carolyn, did, I have a whole bunch of technical questions. Are you ready? Okay. Sure. So, um, so the build to zone, that's the area between the minimum and maximum front setbacks um, that, you know, my, my question is, is what is that? How, it, it looks like that area can be negotiated or, um, so there's, there's the, the public where they, where the, I guess where the public realm ends and then there's this zone where the private, can you describe that, that particular zone for me? And, and, and how much latitude um, might be allowed between the those two different zones. So there's the setback, and then there's you you know you know better what I'm talking about here. If you could just describe all of that. Sure. So um, there's basically the the um, the build the build two zone is where is sort of the maximum extent that you'd want a building setback. So there's a there's an area within which, and so you have the, the front property line, typically, and in most districts, you have um, your setbacks are from your front lot line, your side lot line, and your rear lot line. And um, what we're talking about here is the front lot line. And instead of just having a setback where you have a maximum setback, um, it, you know, or, um, you have, sorry, I should say it the other way, you have, um, instead of saying what you have to set back, you know, you have a 15 foot front setback, let's say, in a residential district. That means you can't come closer than 15 feet. Um, in this district, because a lot in, in a commercial districts, um, they're very different. The relationship between buildings and the street um, is vital for that um, pedestrian experience, for shoppers, for people going to restaurants. And so you don't want buildings set back further than a certain amount. So it's referred to as the build two line. Um, whereas in, a, in, a, in the residential district, you can, you, your starting point is that setback and you can set back even further. And in this case, we wanna make sure that you're not set back too far because that starts to change the sort of the character and the dynamic between the public sidewalk and the building and it loses that sense of connectivity that as a pedestrian to that building face. So there's sort of there's wiggle room in there you don't it's not um, um, there's not a mandatory point in that but there's sort of a you know an area that um, we want to see buildings but we also want to make sure there's enough pedestrian space on the sidewalk. So in some streets, the sidewalks are very narrow. And so it's better not to have a zero setback, but to actually set back a little bit further. So there's a little bit more um, room for people to walk on the sidewalk and not feel like they're cramped up next to that building. Thank you. And that relates to another question I had here, which had to do with, let's see. Um, yeah, so the public realm is broken into three areas, the lot frontage, um, the pedestrian throughway, and public frontage. I, do I have those terms correct? Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. And that it, but it's set in, so the lot frontage, which we were, that's kind of what we were just talking about, that there's some wiggle room there and that, and that can be used to, um, to help uh, promote more pedestrian throughway. Is that? Yes. Or um, it's an area in which you could do some landscaping or, um, plaza seating or something like that. So it, it depends on the situation, but there's sort of a whole realm of things that, that are allowed in that space between the building facade 
and the, and the public sidewalk. And, and how are these three different spaces prioritized? I would imagine that the pedestrian throughway gets is number one. And, uh, or is there a way to prioritize them? I mean, cause I'm imagining there's times, there's gonna be, you know, there's gonna be times where there's plenty of space, but then there's like, we were just talking, you were just saying, there might be a situation where the space is limited. And then right. how does it, how does, what gets priority? So um, again, it's going to be based, so this will come up when there's a new building being proposed. And so it's going to be essentially site specific. So um, an applicant might propose to put a building um, um, set back a little bit further than the zero um, point because the uses proposed are um, such that let's say they want to do a cafe and they want to have some private seating in that space between the building and the sidewalk. They want to have enough space to provide seating without also interfering with the public sidewalk. So in that case, there, so it is, it's going to be um, sort of defined by what's being proposed. The one that the, the identifying these different pieces of the public infrastructure and of the private property allows um, for understanding about um, what the kinds of uses are and the activities that would be envisioned for those different spaces, the public space and the private space. So, um, and as you can imagine, so Main Street in Florence, is has a very different character than Maple Street going north um, towards the bike path. And so you're gonna have a different um, layout, different width. Um, so it's really gonna depend on where in that space you're proposing to do your project. And this, it, this basically just defines a set of parameters and says, okay, here's what, here are the kinds of things that we want applicants to think about. And here are the kinds of things that we want the planning board to sort of evaluate when they're looking at a project. And if you do, um, you know, in some aspects, it's sort of like a cookbook. If you follow exactly the way it's, it says, you know, here are the things to do, then your permit is um, very straightforward and you might, the size of your project might trigger a site plan approval, but um, there's not additional permissions necessary because you're following the cookbook. And then there are other um, elements that might trigger site plan because you're asking for a slightly different way of having that reviewed because of the circumstances that happen to be in that particular location. Okay. Well, so, um, so you mentioned a uh, site plan and I know that there's also a special permit at times for uh, within these, these regulations. Um, generally what, what's the, you know, there, there's going to be some straight, or does everything go to site plan? Let me just start with that. Yeah. Um, so every, most things are site plan, although there are some uses and depending on the district, there are some uses that are really alone, only allowed by special permit. Special permit means the planning board has wide discretion to say in this particular location with this particular use your project doesn't make sense, or it only makes sense if you do this, this, and this. Um, and so it's really about that use that's proposed as opposed to, um, well, in, in, in the form-based code, there are other things that are special permits that are not about uses, but say a driveway. A second driveway in a property requires special permit, but the planning board has discretion to say, no, it's not safe here. We don't want more driveways cutting across the pedestrian access way. So the planning board can say no. When the uses or the dimensions are um, require site plan, so long as it meets the technical requirements, the planning board has to say yes. So it's not about the use or looking at evaluating necessarily about um, you know, there's, there's just not as much discretion. It's really more of a technical review. And most, for the most part, especially in the central business district, most of the uses and um, details here in the form-based code are by site plan. 
there are some additional uses, like I mentioned, um, you know, second driveways um, or other uses in Lawrence Center that are by special permit, like a new auto repair place or um, other uses that not, aren't really always compatible with a downtown pedestrian atmosphere. And so those are the kinds of things that the planning board wants to take special consideration before they're necessarily approved. Thank you. All right, I got more. <laughs> uh, and thank you, counselors and everybody for bearing with me here. Um, okay. Um, ground floor uh, residential. Um, that is, that's a, a part of this package. It doesn't, so it, my understanding is it wouldn't apply to uh, the uh, central business core, but it would apply to side street and, um, and how would it impact projects like, uh, live 155 or the lumber yard, if at all. Uh, so just to clarify the ground floor use limitation sets out a, a dimension, um, and then a provision for what's allowed in those areas. So in the core part of central business, what it means is that you can't have residential is restricted in the first port, first 20 feet of depth front to back, but behind buildings or behind a commercial use on this that's on the street, you can put residential. So it's not a complete prohibition on residential on the ground floor. It's just that the, the street side or the sidewalk facing side has to be commercial in the core district. And in other districts, in other of these districts identified in the form based code, you can have residential across the entire first floor. Um, if you so desire, if that makes sense for your project, that allows more intense multifamily development, which then, of course, um, helps um, address some of our significant housing stock shortages and puts those units where it can support um, commercial development. But what it means for the lumber yard and Live 155 is if they wanted to in the future modify their first floor and have residential on the first floor, they um, actually Live 155 is, is still in the um, core district. So it's not going it, to, the same, I mean, they built, there are resident, there's a residential component to Live 155 in the back, and that's how they were permitted, and it will stay that way. The lumber yard is in the side street district, and therefore they could, if they wanted to, um, uh, um, renovate at some point and make ground floor residential units um, on the sidewalk. Well, I noticed today when I walked by there that um, uh, Wayfinders is setting up an office space. So I think they've solved yeah. it for the moment, but um, right. yeah. And so, the, and so this ground floor residential um, would extend, so that's for side street. So the, the portions of Holly Street that are, would be included in, in this mm -hmm. side street would, mm -hmm. would allow first floor residential. Right. Okay. And, and which brings me to like a more general question because those properties along Holly Street, there's uh, there's a, there's uh, probably six properties that are changing that would change from URC to Side Street, and there's also a few properties that are office industrial that would switch to Side Street. Could you describe what you know in terms of going office industrial to Side Street? What what kind of changes that would mean? for uh, possible uses and construction. So OI to <laughs> side street. Sure. Um, so office industrial is primarily um, office, back office uses, not like um, um, banking or um, medical office where you've got sort of lots of turnover of um, traffic. It also allows, um, uh, manufacturing and trade some trades use and things of that sort. 
it only allows residential um, as uh, a component on the second floor and higher in office industrial. Um, and there are, and so no, no kind of commercial restaurant uses or retail are allowed in office industrial. So the change would allow both uh, residential components um, throughout an entire building, um, as well as a mix of other commercial uses that aren't currently allowed in the office industrial use. So restaurant use, um, more um, customer oriented office uses and um, uh, as well as, you know, um, the heights are basically the same in terms of the building scale that's allowed. So those are the primary use changes. Okay, so that's, that's OI to side street. What about URC to side street? Um, so the five or six properties there are um, sort of maxed out, I think, for residential uses. Um, they would probably continue to be residential uses and that would be allowed. So it's not making any non-conformities with the change. It also would allow, um, um, you know, office uses that aren't allowed now by actually in an urban residential scene now, it requires a special permit um, for an office use, but it has to be a part of a mix. So it can't be an entirely Entire, it can't be an office use only. There has to be some residential in a building. So for example, on State Street right now, coming out of downtown, there are several of those um, uh, residential structures that have been converted to office uses. There's a real estate office, there's some um, psychotherapy offices, but there's a residential component to those as well. And those have been allowed by special permit. With a conversion to side street, it wouldn't require a special permit to do that kind of um, change. And it allows, it opens up, you know, smaller scale work opportunities or office opportunities for people who might be doing a startup business and they can't afford to pay main street rents. Um, so there's a little bit more flexibility there and also a little bit more flexibility in creating more residential units, you know, within a structure or in addition to those structures. Thank you. All right, I still got more. I'm sorry, everybody. Keep <laughs> um, going. All right, thank you. <laughs> um, central business architecture. Um, so Carolyn, as I was looking at these design standards, they reminded me a lot of uh, some of the guidelines that um, central business architecture currently um, looks to when they're considering, um, you know, whether or not to approve a particular plan. And um, so, so two things here. Can you describe uh, CBAC's future role under this and also how this actually kind of is very much like CBAC or how it's different? Sure. So the Central Business Architecture Committee um, currently um, oversees any facade changes and any new construction in the, in the entire geographic area of Central Business Architecture. They have sort of one, they have a design guidelines manual from which many of these form-based design items have been extracted and put into this form-based code. But there's still a few um, um, provisions that only Central Business Architecture Committee would review because um, they deal with uh, facade materials or roof materials, which are not allowed to be uh, addressed in the zoning ordinance. Um, and the original guidelines were really sort of focused on the character of sort of that historic brick core of Main Street and a little bit of King Street and Pleasant Street. Um, and even though there were provisions for 
residential style structures. The focus was really on trying to replicate theme commercial type buildings that you see along Main Street. So by breaking the central business district into sort of these three sub districts, even though um, uh, some of the, there will be some form and design review done. It will be in the side street districts and the gateway districts. The planning board will be reviewing those and um, reviewing them in the context of the whole site plan. Um, and it allows a little bit more flexibility on the type of architecture. So um, there's, a, there's been sort of this, um, push to replicate the historic theme type of commercial buildings, even as the central business district expanded into these other areas that really don't have that historic core um, um, kind of character. So um, by breaking it into these different parts and, and pulling the central business architecture committee or, or, or narrowing the review to sort of that historic core, it, um, their focus will continue to be on that theme commercial kind of character of that part of downtown. And then planning board will be reviewing new buildings in the other districts. They won't be reviewing facade changes because um, that's not going to be um, part of the review. It's only if you're doing a new building or a new addition. Okay, and um, okay, so CBAC is basically still keeping the same scope of responsibility where mm -hmm. with side street and entranceway, we're just expanding the central business possibilities. And with that, there's gonna be more latitude than re recreating the facade of downtown. Right. Okay, all right, good, all right. Um, that means I'm understanding it. <laughs> Go if ahead. I could jump in on that. Um, so the CBAC's jurisdiction right now basically a company, it encompasses what will become if this passes the central business core and the side street. Is that, is that about right, Carolyn? Yeah. But not the gateway. Um, right. And if this passes the the CBAC's jurisdiction will just be in the core and the side street will um, have, you know, planning board uh, or historical commission approval or review. Historical commission review will not come into play for any new construction. Um, the only time historical commission review would come into play um, would be if there is a historic building that is being proposed for demolition. Otherwise, they don't have jurisdiction for any new construction. Right, okay. So I, this is a, it's kind of a trick question, Carolyn. So does this strengthen CBAC's ability in historic, when, you know, considering a historic structure as we've seen with another building, or does, is it, is it helping or is it um, diminishing its role in this? It's, it, it's overall strength to protect um, certain structures or maybe it's unchanged. I think, I guess I would say it's neutral. Okay. Um, the, in one way, I suppose someone might argue that it's reducing their ability to oversee um, modifications to historic structures because um, their geographic area is shrinking, um, uh, jurisdiction, sorry, is shrinking. And um, what's required, the only, um, <coughs> so if, for example, this is the only place where you're sort of swapping jurisdiction with the historical commission is, is in relationship to a request for demolition of an historic building. In the current situation in the central business district, if an applicant wants to demolish a building, they can only get approval from central business architecture committee 
if they're showing they're building a new building in its place and it meets the design standards and um, there's no other viable use of the building shown. Under historical commission review, there's no requirement that you rebuild a building or rebuild in the same location. Um, and the only um, evaluation is whether or not you your project is delayed for you to rethink whether or not you have to de demolish the building. Um, and that's the extent of it. So um, someone could just, you know, wait up to a year is the maximum amount the historical commission review has to um, restrict demolition. And you don't have to rebuild a building in its place. Um, it can just go after that year. Okay. So, all right, well, um, so in terms of the historic pr preservation aspect, it seems like we, the form-based code isn't solving it and we still need to uh, tweak things a little bit. So, um, all right, what else do I got here? Um, um, upper story setbacks. Are we really going to do that anywhere, or um, I, 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 I don't saw know. That in, it has has such a thing been proposed, or um, no, kind of like man uh, roofs, or <laughs> well, it's really to address. Um, it's really only going to be applicable in the. Um, the side street and gateway district. And I don't know that we're gonna get buildings over 55 feet um, in those areas. And that's then after that point, then you'd have step backs up to a taller, you know, or maybe you have a, you know, a penthouse on top that doesn't go all the way to the extent of the edge of the buildings. Um, okay. I don't know enough about building um, requirements, but I know that at some point, I don't know if it's four stories or five stories where the construction um, changes and so it makes it more expensive. So I, I just don't know what the demand is for something like that. So I don't know if we're able to okay, so ever see. I guess that's what the, the question is. There, it's, in, it's, it's allowed in here, but as of this time, there's no demand out there for that type of, of design. That we know of. Carolyn, wasn't that, um, I apologize, that um, right ahead. site plan, well, and I'll let you get back to your questions, but that site plan um, for the Goggins real estate, um, I don't know if that fits the definition of this kind of roof setback, as I recall, because I remember there was, we, we talked a lot about the sort of lighting issue on the, yeah. um, on the roof yeah. of that as sort of a, um, sort of clubhouse area for the residents for the taller in the back. But I think I remember there was sort of like a breezeway or causeway or some, not causeway, that's not the right word, but. So it wasn't one there's single no, structure no as I recall. <laughs> Do what? There's no ocean here. There's no ocean, um, causeway is the wrong word entirely. <laughs> totally wrong word. Um, so no, you're right. I mean, there was a conversation, uh, of course, about the um, rooftop terrace, and there was right. just sort of an elevator structure there. So it wasn't a real, it wasn't really a full story, but you're, there was a, a portion of the massing up there, but it was really just mechanicals. Um, and really, this would come to play, this is really about sort of where their, the districts are next to residential districts. So the 55 Feet matches um, the heights allowed in the uh, abutting residential district. So, um, but the, the second Goggins proposed project, um, meaning the most recent one, um, did have some issues about you know what was happening on the rooftop. Thank you, and Carolyn. Sorry, if you could just uh, bring me up to speed. So it's above. 55 feet, it would be a requirement for some, for the additional stories to be set back. So that's above five stories typically. Um, yeah. Yep. Okay. 
Jim, did you have more questions? Oh, I, I got a few more. I, I, <laughs> I think they're good questions though. Let's see. And um, in Councillor Elkins, I, I appreciated the um, throwback to your time on the planning board there. So thank you. Um, so there was a mention in the language, where is it? Let me see, I have it here. Um, bum, 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 bum. There was something about where language in this uh, particular, in, 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 these, in this language, it, it, it will apply to other zones or districts. And um, let me see if I can find the exact thing here. I thought I cut it and pasted okay. it here. Well, there are some elements that are still in the zoning that are applicable to this zone district. So I don't, I don't know if that's what you're referring to. Um, well, I, I just want to be clear that whatever we're approving here is is completely just for um, the 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 five different uh, five zones that we're talking about here. Correct. Yes. You know, okay. But it so, but it does go the other way. So, for example, the okay. parking standards in the other parts of zoning are applicable here. In it, you know there or there's some sign standards that are applicable for this district too that are elsewhere in the zoning. Right. They would still apply, but not the op, not the other way around. So this code is just for these um, five districts. Thank you. All right. Um, were you so I, I think I'm I found some of the examples, Jim. Were, were you referring to there's this uh, in 22.054, which amends chapter 350.11.6? It talks about the requested use meets any spec special regulation set forward in this chapter. And I think that chapter is site plan approval in general. And then it says, including consistency with the intent of the character-based zoning districts as written in 350, 21, and 22 when applicable. So that, that it's only when applicable is, is what you're saying, Carolyn, that it's only when it's in those districts that, yeah. that it has to meet those, those right. requirements. Right. Thank you for clarifying. That was helpful. Um, all right, we're getting there. I, I'm, I'm down to just a few here. I'm saving my best one for last. Let's see. Um, but this isn't hit. Uh, the, um, so Carolyn, one of, one of the concerns I mentioned a, at, at the last, when did I talk about this? I know I mentioned the, the, what I called the step down from you know, the central business to side street. And then we start to get into the URs. And I, can you, so central business, you, you know, it, you, you can build out the entire lot. Um, and that's true for side street as well? Um, no side street, then you have start having the step backs throughout the district. Okay, and then the because same- Because there are some areas that abut the urban residential C district. And, and then and then it's more so when you get into entrance way. Um, it, it's the same step back, same standard. So fifty five feet, then down to forty five. Okay. And um, and there's there's no is there a green space requirement or open space requirement for entrance way or side street? Um, it's the same as it is now, which is really just about the landscaping components that are required. So um, depending on the site, um, you know, so it might be five, like, five percent. So similar to like the, the new hotel on Con Street or something like that? Um, so they, they have more open space than the minimum required. Okay. So they they haven't built the max to the maximum capacity there okay. they're building. All right. I but it was generally five 
percent in the GB general business district and entrance business district. Okay. Was five percent. All right, and um, yeah, I, 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 I am going to be interested in you know following up further on, um, you know, that discussion around URC, um, and um, the green space, open space requirement. Um, let's see. Um, dee, 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 dee. Um, all right. Um, two, so the last two, um, corner lots. And I noticed that, you know, I, I, I mentioned this, this idea that uh, Joel Russell had it back when we were doing the zoning revisions committee of the, the strong corners. Can you talk about what, what is in this zoning to really enhance corners uh, within uh, central business, within all of these zones? With the, with the concept, with the idea that if, if the corner structure is really strong and prominent and, um, and inviting, it, it, it enhances development down the, down the street and, you know, uh, and, um, and prom promotes that, that's where you get the, the um, foundation for that streetscape feeling and that it starts with the corners. Right, so basically um, in, you know, building that's mid block, you have um, the front facade is very important because that's the one that speaks to the sidewalk or the interfaces with the sidewalk. When you have a corner, you have two public streets. So the, it's really important for both those facades so two facades to really um, incorporate those design and form characteristics and elements. So there's language in there about situations when you have corner building. So, um, you know, I'm trying to think of a situation where that might come up. Most of the corners are already built out um, in these districts, but certainly um, there may be more opportunity for that in the gateway or side street districts where there might be some opportunity for more build out. But um, that's right. It sort of sets the stage for both street um, segments um, in either direction. Well, a possibility could be at, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, where probate court is? What's the side street there? Um, right now- well, we That's a, a lane, it's an alley, but yes, yeah. it could apply. Um, or where the, um, restaurant burned on the corner of Holly and Bridge, you know, yeah. all those years ago. <laughs> right, right. Um, we ever get a new building there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, all right. So this brings me to my last question, which is uh, basically, a, um, so the, you know, how would buildings such as the former faces in the CVS building look differently if we had this current zoning back when these uh, structures were, were built? Very different. I mean, even so, um, central business architecture guideline um, and zoning that complemented it were um, first adopted in 1999. Um, so, so starting from that point, 1999 forward, if those buildings had been proposed, they would not have been one story. They would have been at least 30 feet tall. So two and a half, three stories. So, you know, going back 23 years ago, that's when that would have um, happened. This is um, not replaced. I mean, this is um, the zoning and is replacing um, to a certain extent, the central business architecture um, guidelines that we have in place, but not taking anything away. It's just a new, it's a substitution of what's already been um, in place for 23 years. And so, um, and so to the, so as an example of, had with these newer regulations that we got back in 1999, one of the outcomes of that was the development on Strong Avenue. Is that correct? Where 
you know, that that would be more reflected. So we can anticipate more structures like that under this new zoning. When, you know, if somebody wants to uh, redevelop the, um, the, the FACES property or, um, or the CVS property. Right. Okay. All right, I think I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> Marissa and Stan. Stan, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to follow up on a couple of the lines of questioning that, that Jim pursued. Um, Carolyn, the, the uh, Central Business Architecture Committee will have its geographic jurisdiction reduced to the, to the, the, central, uh, the central business zone, correct? Right. That's so core. the core, yeah. yes. So the, um, the elements that it would have uh, reviewed in uh, the other two zones now will revert to the planning board. Is that, is that correct? Uh, with a, correct, with the exception that the um, areas that are now identified as gateway, central business gateway, are not part of the central business district now. Yes. So they're, they're in the planning board jurisdiction now solely, um, and that will remain the same. But my point is that the, uh, the actual review uh, will not be uh, abandoned altogether. It will simply be consolidated within the planning board review of a project. Correct. And it gives the planning board more components to evaluate than um, what they have today. And, and in effect, that's then streamlining the, the review and the permitting process. Right. Okay. Uh, in terms of uh, allowing flexibility for residential space on uh, ground floors in the, uh, in the gateway and the side street districts, uh, there are, uh, that's not, of course, requiring that developers put residential there. It's allowing for that flexibility choice. Exactly. Yep. What what um, what are some of the uh, the design elements in in the zoning code that will um, uh, that will promote that flexibility so that space which may be residential for a period of time could then revert to commercial if if there's a need for that or if a developer wants to or uh, the owner of a property wants to to switch that use. Um, I think that there are facade treatments that are allowed across the spectrum. And if, and if an applicant starts with sort of more of a residential character, um, you know, that might be harder to change down the road, but it's really probably going to be more about interior, um, uh, building out to, um, a building code standard at the outset that allows for, um, you know, opening up wall space on the first floor, maybe already building in extra fire um, separation between the, the first, you know, commercial, what might be a commercial use in the first floor. So it's probably going to be more invisible things that aren't necessarily. Um, uh, reviewed by the planning board or in the planning board's jurisdiction. Um, a lot of it really is gonna boil down to building code changes. But, but fair to say that there will be that, there will be that. <laughs> it is, it's kind of dry. Uh, there will be that flexibility so that if now there's a residential need, so at some point in the future, uh, if uh, the uh, if there's more of a uh, a market need for commercial space, that that those kind of invisible changes would be there that would allow for that that conversion over over yeah. time. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Marissa, do you have any questions before I take a shot? Uh, no, no, I don't think so. Okay. 
Um, so I have a few uh, mainly technical questions. So in item H, um, it talks about the change and oh, let me just bring that up. We can refer to it. So this is about change of use. Um, and it talks about changes, change, extension, or alteration of legally pre-existing non-conforming structures, uses, or lots. So um, I just want to clarify the intent of this is to only allow uses, the uses that are non-conforming to carry forward, like all the other aspects. Um, so the, the setbacks and any other non-conforming aspect would then, if there was a change, it would have to Apply, um, agree with the new code. Um, is that is that correct? Um, it's it's generally correct, but it also depends on the extent of the modifications. So, if there's not going to be a big build out on the pro on a on an existing building, then, for example, a building that's set way back. Um, and there's no addition, there's just proposed use changes, then you're not gonna see a building sort of um, get um, be modified on its site. But to the extent that there is an addition, that addition is going to be directed to be on the front of the building so it comes closer to the street. Um, even, but there may be situations where an addition is so small, it doesn't, close that gap that exists today. Um, so it, it's going to be depend, site dependent, but yes, the goal, the idea is that, you know, modifications would move in that direction to comply with the site layout, as well as the use changes or use allowances. Okay, so as long as they were moving in that direction of conformity, that would, be allowed. So yeah, I'm just thinking, you know, you have something that's 70 feet back and can you do nothing with it in, in terms of the structure unless you build it, build something closer? Uh, right, I mean, that's the thing is we don't wanna say, no, we don't want your investment in the community because you're not coming all the way. You know, we wanna encourage new investment, um, but as new investments is made, then, do it on this um, in the way in which this um, the code is um, directing building structures and locations and design. Great. Um, the next question is about item J, um, and that one is it's amending site plan approval, I think. Um, and so this one it's eleven point six B two. And it talks about all these districts, but it doesn't talk about the Florence Village Center or Florence Village General Districts. Um, so I'm not seeing where that, where that those would be referenced. There's in, the, in that section, there's a whole list of, of the districts and, and it says what they, uh, what the different requirements are for the different districts. So you're on um, 22054? Yeah, and then 11.6 B2. And I think you'd have to actually, to see it in context, you'd have to actually bring up the, the actual code. But essentially, you know, we have this um, central businesses district, uh, general business, entranceway business is crossed out, general industrial and OI zoning districts. Um, there's this list, but yep. where does Florence Village go? Right. So, um, so that is the um, section relating to um, traffic mitigation. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we don't require traffic mitigation um, 
So I guess you're right to clarify. Um, we sh there we should add Florence Village Center there um, to that section because that's in the line that doesn't require mitigation. Um, the modifications were just adding multiples to the central business and deleting a district that we're no longer going to be using, which is EB. But you're right, it would make sense to add the Florence Village reference to that section, just okay. to make sure. So, um, would you, yeah. what, could you put together the exact wording for us and then we can make that recommendation? Now or sure. We, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, really, it's just um, I would say insert the FVC and FVG. So FC, FVC, comma FVG um, in between CB and GB. Okay, I'll make as that. an insert. I'll make that motion as a, a recommended recommended amendment. Second. Yep. Any discussion on that? And uh, Pam, do you have have that? Okay, so I have insert FC. I'm sorry, FVC FVG in between CB, and I'm sorry, I missed the other part, Carolyn. In between CB and GB. And GB. Okay. Yeah. So I do have it. Any discussion on that? Recommended Stan? Alex, could we just for the benefit of those um, who are listening in, just can we explain in layman's terms what we're what we're adding here? Do you want me to do that? Yeah, or? I think you're, you're the, okay. the, the, I understand it most fully. So um, in section eleven point six B two, which is this um, amendment is addressing, is a table of required traffic mitigation based on the zoning district in which a project is located. And so this modification is getting rid of the reference. The way it's written now is getting rid of the reference to entrance business, which is EB, and then just adding a plural to CB because now there are going to be three CBs instead of just one CB. But Councilor Jarrett pointed out that it doesn't reference the new Florence Village Center Zone District. So we want to make sure that it's clear that no mitigation is required for those either because that's that's the intention. In fact, right now we don't have Florence Center is zoned GB and Office Industrial, and those are two districts which currently don't require traffic mitigation. So it's keeping it the same, but just clarifying that we're also including those two new um, categories of zone. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Good catch, Alex. Great. Any other discussion or clarification on that one? Pam, are you uh, with us? I'm here. Yeah. Uh, could you give a do a roll call on that amendment? Okay. I I think I need a second on that. Second. Thank you. Okay, so Councilor Jarrett? Yes. Councilor Elkins? Yes. Councilor Malton? Yes. Councilor Nash? Yes. Thank you. Great. That amendment passes. Um, so I had a question around um, so this is this is in the main uh, form based code editions. Um, <clears throat> it's three fifty dash twenty one ten, which is the the public realm components. Um, it talks about the threshold for coming into compliance when there is a change, um, and so it says you know when when there is when it will disturb an existing public realm condition. Um, 
then then ev- you know everything that you do has to come into compliance. And I'm just trying to get a sense of of how much what it, what considers a disturbance. Um, you know, if you're if you're moving a a walkway slightly, or is anything like that going to require the whole thing to come into compliance, or is there some um, some threshold that that allows for minor changes without uh, having to do a tremendous amount of work? Uh, so this would also relate to what the scale of the project is so if it's a brand new building and an example would be uh, live 155 there in order to make the um, front entrance um, accessible and meet AAB standards for accessibility to the front door they had to um, regrade the pub, the sidewalk um, to match and they had to make a change to their elevation to match the sidewalk. So in that case, the planning board required them to take the whole sidewalk and make it um, accessible um, to the building, not just in front of the building, but they had to match it going back to property line to property line. Um, And in fact, the planning board now requires sidewalk installation in the public way for any project um, um, that's coming, you know, new building construction um, anywhere, not just in in the central business district. So we were, we view this as sort of a heads up to everybody to say, okay, look, this is what we expect of you. If you were cutting the sidewalk panel, you're going to have to replace the whole sidewalk if you have to cut it for water and sewer line connections, you can't just do a little patch job. You actually have to look at the whole thing and make sure it's accessible. So um, when you're when there's a project of a scale that's going to be a new building, um, there's also a lot of impact with construction vehicles over that sidewalk. And so many times um, the sidewalk is just falling apart at the end of construction anyway. So it's not on, it's, it's more likely than not that some aspect has to be fixed. And so we just wanna make it clear, this is what's expected when you do fix it. Right, great, thank you for that clarification. Mm-hmm. Um, those are the questions that I have right now. Jim. Oh, you're muted, Jim. Muted. All right, there you go. Two more quick ones. Um, so, uh, Carolyn, I was just I, I was reviewing the map for downtown, and I noticed that um, uh, St. Mary's is not part of the central business core. That it's it appears as part of side street, and uh, just to clarify, that's it's still under C back then, correct? No, right? Yeah. No, so then it would be fu- uh, preservation of that would fall to the historic commission. Yes. So is that right? Is there is um is could that be amended? Um, to, I mean, do we want to consider amending the map in that way to include St. Mary's or or not? Um, I'm just thinking in terms of the the long-term preservation of, of that, that building, which I think central <laughs> business has been really, um, is, it, it's central business architecture, I think has been an, um, a, an important mechanism to have in preserving uh, St. John's. We still have our fingers crossed, but things seem to be moving there in a positive direction. So I, I'm just throwing it out there in terms of if if we might want to give some more thought to that. So my response to that would be that this is a unique property because it's also, um, that church is also in the Elm Street Historic District. (laughs) So the Elm Street Historic District review is, very stringent as well, more so than just sort of the generic demolition under historical commission. So 
already now there's sort of two overlapping jurisdictions in this unique situation. Okay. Um, I would, I would, we purposefully left it out of the core district okay. because you're going up on the other side of State Street. It's sort of out of that um, historic main street area. Um, we think that um, that's a great that site is so big and it's a great opportunity for multifamily housing right there next to downtown. And so um, that's one of the primary reasons why it's recommended to be um, in the side street district. And there's still the protection, some protection of, of demolition review under the Elm Street Historic District. Okay. All right. Well, it wasn't entirely reassuring, but thank you for the layering of that. <laughs> um, and one other thing related to the map, there's right next to, you know, the same area where St. John's, there's a white space in the middle of the map, like off of State Street and, you know, between State Street and, oh, uh, where's, the, let me pull the map up. Do you know what I'm talking about, Carolyn? On, um, on South Street? No, it's, uh, so there's, if you look at the map for downtown, the proposed map, there's this white space. It, it looks like it includes like the State Street parking lot. No, I don't think that's it. it it's Pulaski Park. Is that Pulaski Park? Oh yeah, it's yeah. Pulaski Park. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. It was, you were talking about South Street. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't want us to build anything at Pulaski Park. <laughs> No, it's a different zone. It's it's farms, forests, and recreation. So that's okay. why it's not in that. Yeah, I had it on the north side of Main Street in my head. Thank you for clarifying. Okay, Jim, uh, I do think uh, I appreciate you bringing up the question about the the sea sea jurisdiction, and I think it's it is something that we should think about and and talk about at council. Um, and I mean, we can talk about it now as well. It, 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 does, it does mean that there are some historic structures that are kind of outside of the core that, that will have uh, less review and less protection. Um, so it's worth having a discussion about it. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and yeah, I, mean, I guess I could put that out there. You know, is, is, is any kind of, you know, do we think that this is an appropriate uh, consolidation of, of, of the area that, that CBAC has its jurisdiction. Well, I, Marissa. Um, I, I, would, I would not be in favor of uh, adjusting um, that. I, I think that the, um, the I, I, I definitely would not be in favor of carving out specifically um, churches, um, uh, you know, any particular, or, or let me put it this way, any particular property uh, just because of the, the nature of it. Um, but I also, I tend to, I, I tend to think we have, you know, we have lots of um, historic buildings. We have lots of old buildings in, in, in Northampton and um, that um, I, I'm, I'm very comfortable with this, um, with this defining of of that board's review and 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 keeping it away and and not changing the proposed zoning amendment um i mean i certainly if the city council wants to if the council wants to have a conversation about it um i i would not be in favor of attaching anything in our recommendation um relative to that though jim so Carolyn, currently the structure is, the St. Mary's is part of the central business architecture jurisdiction. Um, correct, because we expanded, when we went um, up down State Street, we expanded it to that side of State Street for that one parcel depth and then down towards Bedford Terrace. So what um, I'm talking about is not changing rather than changing. <laughs> anyway, 
You know what I you, what I want to do is between now and when we get this to council is spend a little time uh, studying uh, the impacts of you know, what the Elm Street Historic District uh, uh, tools are, and you know I maybe put in a, a a call to Sarah to review some of that and and get a sense of you know because maybe there's plenty of protection there maybe there's a whole added level that CBAC doesn't allow for and um and i i can report on that at council so Unless, yeah i mean oh, just yeah. so you i mean under both the central Missouri architecture committee and elm street both those bodies you know someone can't just come in and say i want to demo something they need to show that there's no viable reuse and we know that it's really going to be hard to find a reuse for that church bottom line so it could sit there for another 15 years with no use that doesn't necessarily help anybody either um and it could be you know a problem if slates can you know start sliding off the roof because there's no money to preserve the building but those two the the you know, there has to be um, an effort by anyone who owns the property that's requesting demolition to come and improve. There's no viable use, you know, even let's say maybe they need to take the spires down. That would go to Elm Street. It wouldn't go um, to planning board. And uh, so under the revised zoning map with side street, removal of elements wouldn't go to the planning board re for review but it would have to go to elm street because it's a it's a change to the to a feature within the elm street historic district but that also might allow someone to feel like they had a better handle of being able to reuse the building because it's less of a maintenance you know um issue um but almost in any scenario if someone puts together a package proving that there's no viable reuse of a building, then it's likely a committee would vote to allow that to be demolished as opposed to sitting there for another 15, 20, 30 years with nothing being done to it. Any other? Uh, discussion on that particular question. Any other questions for Carolyn? Stan. Uh, I just wanted to uh, review for a minute, uh, Carolyn, the process, we're, we're at the end of uh, the hearing process. We're on the brink of sending this to the City Council for a vote. Uh, this has uh, taken place. Uh, I mean, we've gotten here over a period of four years. Is that is that correct? And correct. Uh, roughly, how many public forums have there been? Six, eight. Six, maybe? six to eight. Six to eight public yeah. forums. Uh, and I was at the last in January. I heard uh, uh, comments uh, at the uh, at the beginning of our hearing on March 24th and, and tonight as well. So I've heard from a lot of local voices, both publicly and in private conversation. And uh, but I also wanted to get a little bit of outside perspective because obviously um, this is you know this is not the first place where form based uh, zoning code is being proposed. Um, uh, one community that is, has used it for four years is uh, Canton, Connecticut, uh, which is a bit smaller than Northampton. It's about 10,000 population. It's in Hartford County. So I talked to the uh, director of planning there. And interesting to me was uh, the fact that Canton has both a central business district and a village district. And uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, motivations for adopting uh, form-based code there was to preserve the character of each. Uh, and, you know, obviously the elements of the exact zoning is are, differ between Canton and, and Northampton. But in terms of the, uh, the goals, um, uh, 
the planner told me that uh, he feels that they have succeeded in rather than under the under the pre-existing condition of trying to uh, trying to use uh, the same zoning regulations for both a, a central business commercial area and a, a, a uh, what he called the mill village district in Canton was uh, was was kind of, was a mishmash it didn't work and he said the form based code that has uh, uh, that has uh, really emphasized and uh, reinforced the character of each district has worked there it is it has created more flexibility it has also streamlined the development process he said it's clearer to developers what exactly is needed in each of their districts and while he says that inevitably there's going to be some tweaking uh, needed um, based on what 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 projects uh, are 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 being built there, uh, he said that overall uh, the goals that uh, he had have been have been uh, realized in Canton. So that, I mean, to me that was that's just one example, but it was it's 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 reassuring to know that. The goals that I think Northampton has in adopting this uh, are very similar in terms of being character-based and and also adding flexibility to to uh, to the current market needs. Uh, so that was reassuring to me. So I I'm I'm supportive of this. Dan. Dan. Yeah, I. I'm gonna pick up right where Stan left off. I am supportive of it as well. Um, that uh, that I, I like to think that this um, that these form-based codes had their roots back in the zoning revisions committee. And Carol and will remember us talking about that. When was that? 2009, something like that. And that one of the the goals that the ZRC talked about was we wished we could jump right into form-based code particularly for downtown and for uh, uh, in, 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 into other zones. And that, um, but at that time it seemed to be too big of a reach. And so um, we did modifications that, um, that uh, uh, you know, I, I think there's aspects of it that we may wanna revisit like around open space and green space. And Carolyn and I have already been talking a little bit about this and we've, heard from a number of residents saying we need to look at that. But I, I just wanna say that um, I'm supporting this just in terms of when, when you read the, you know, looking through the hundred plus pages, you can pick just about any line in there and you can read it and understand what it's saying. Whereas if you go to our current zoning and, and open up, you know, a section on, you know, central business or what you know it's just like what you, your head starts spinning and that this was one of the things that we really though it it was the other side of the desirability of form-based code wasn't wasn't just that you know it, it 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 made sense it's it's that it's so much more understandable to even the lay person and that you know there's pictures and there's diagrams and yeah, there's always some questions you need to ask, like, you know, like I was around the public realm, but that you, you can quickly get to the bottom of what's, what's being uh, asked of, of property owners and developers and, um, and that the important piece is the emphasis, emphasis that it puts on um, establishing and protecting the public realm, because that's what makes all of this work, is that when we, we're really kind of you know public space for pedestrians for outdoor seating for for street furniture for fire hydrants for bike racks for all of that stuff then um then then we're going to have a good plan we're going to have good outcomes um and that um and that yeah so i i'm all for this this big step that we're we're finally taking and um and i i know as i'm saying this that bob recommends behind me also a former ZRC member who's also saying, yes, Jim, vote for this. So um, anyway, so I'll be voting yes. Marissa. Uh, and uh, I, I will keep it brief, but I do also want to echo, I, I wouldn't want my, my, uh, my, my 
lack of questions to indicate a lack of curiosity or in uh, uh, digging into this legislation, what it, what it reflects is the fact that I have been privileged to be a part of this conversation and presentations about it, um, not just now, but then in my time during the planning board. Um, and I, I, th I think it's wonderful. I think it is, um, I think it's a great um, step forward for the city, um, for both downtown and for Florence uh, Center. Um, that is, it's just really uh, well crafted. Uh, and I really want to commend the, the planning board and the, the planning board and everybody who collaborated um, in this committee, um, who's co collaborated over years now to, to just as Jim said, make this a really accessible um, code that is going to be uh, I, I think the benefits and the values uh, both to just city citizens and, and residents who uh, are going to benefit from it and from the, the developers and builders who have to use it <laughs> as, a, as a tool and understanding of what they are. I just I cannot commend everybody's worked so hard on this um, enough. It's just it's just really strong work and the city should be very proud um, starting way back in 2009, um, to have uh, us going forward with count to the council um, with this, um, with this great great plan that's very specific to our city and very well thought out. Um, so kudos um, to everybody. Um, and with that, of course, I, I will be supporting this and heartily recommend the legislation. Thank you. And it's my turn. Um, so yeah, I, I am in favor of this. I, I love the pedestrian focused design, the architectural uh, feature requirements, you know, it's well thought out. It's expanding the uses, uh, you know, while regulating the form, which I think will create a really great uh, experience for all of us that are, that are using, uh, that are using these dis districts. And I've, I've, you know, been following this process for years, um, and um, I've had ample opportunity to get my questions answered. Uh, so thank you to all the, the staff uh, who have put in so much time and to the planning board members and all the people who showed up and at those in-person meetings years ago, <laughs> uh, as well as the virtual ones since then. Um, and I, I think that, you know, I think a lot about sort of this question of do cities, does it make sense to live in cities and to have the, um, a, a density of, uh, of having the things that where we live and the things that we need be close together? And uh, if, you, if you look at that um, from a, a carbon perspective, if we look at a map of, of carbon emissions uh, per capita, um, you know, if you look at it just in general, you see these cities have all these carbon emissions. But if you reverse it and say per capita, um, then cities are the greenest thing you, you could imagine because people are just using uh, that, you know, that much less carbon uh, because they are able to, to access the things that they, they need or whether that's uh, work or recreation or, and so, for us to build the capacity to have more residential and to have to support the commercial that, that we do have and and have that be thriving, um, I think that's that's excellent and making it such a, a lovely and livable place. Um, and I think that that's what this code is attempting to to move us toward. Um, so um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think this is a a I will. I will vote to, to recommend this to council and um, this will show up if, if we if we vote on this tonight uh, if, and if, assuming the council president uh, approves it, it would come up this Thursday um, on our agenda. <clears throat> and for one vote, unless we decide to extend it. So any other um, discussion on this motion that we have on the floor for a positive recommendation as amended uh, by the planning board. Okay, seeing none, uh, roll call please. Councilor Jarrett? Yes. Councilor Elkins? Yes. Councilor Moulton? Yes. Councilor Nash? Yes. Uh, okay. So that passes and will be moved on to council. And that is the 
Yes, thank you, Carolyn. You are free to go as we will be shortly, um, unless Yay. there is <laughs> unless there is new business. I would uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. I unmuted the wrong person. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Jarrett. Yes. Uh, Councilor Elkins. Yes. Councilor Moulton. Yes. And Councilor Mass. Yes. Okay, we are adjourned. Thank you, Pam Powers. For